So when I was in college, I was a part of a campus ministry that every year took a spring break trip to Panama City Beach, Florida. And the intention of this trip was part like conference training session and part evangelistic outreach. So the structure of the day was the same every day. You had a morning and evening kind of worship and teaching session. And then in the afternoon, the expectation was that you were going to go out onto the beach and share the gospel with college students who were down there to have a good time. And so I was down there, it was a couple days into the week, and I'm out walking the beach with a friend. We always went out in pairs, and we see these two guys kind of on the fringe, on the outside of their friend group on the beach, and we just go up to them and we start a conversation with them. Now, the, the group we were there with who was putting this conference on, they give you a tool to kind of help engage and initiate conversation. And the, the tool is just a simple survey, right? About a five-question survey that asks college students what they thought about faith, what they thought about Jesus. And then the last question of that survey was intended to be, a transition question to share the gospel with people if they seemed open. And so we're in this conversation with these guys. And as soon as we start, one guy of these two friends is like, I'm out of here. Like, I see the deal. I don't want to be a part of this. And he just kind of like walks away. The other guy stays and engages. And a few uh, questions into the survey, it becomes apparent that he's like three sheets to the wind, that he is like far gone. He has been having a good time all day. But he keeps going with us through the questions, and so we just keep engaging him. And then it comes to the question where you're supposed to transition to the gospel, and he seems kind of open to it. And so I, I pull out my little booklet, and I just start working through the nature of the gospel with this guy, and I get not even one page in, and he goes, stop. And I was like, okay. So I just stopped. He plucks the booklet from my hand, and I'm like, what have I done? Have I offended him? As he's super angry, and he looks at me, and he goes, sit down. And so I sat down. Like, I just sat right down on the beach. He pulls up his cooler. He sits down, and he proceeds to evangelize me. Like, he proceeds to share the gospel with me, and he's going turn by turn through this book, reading it to me, trying to, like, and, you know, tell me what I need to do. And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm just going to let this guy go for it. I mean, at, at least he's hearing it, I think, you know. And every 30 seconds or so, he would get distracted. Like, seagulls would come swoop in, and he'd start to look at them. Friends would walk by and call out to them. Attractive young ladies would walk by, and he'd do it on them. And I'd just keep snapping. I'm like, hey, hey, back to the book. What's the next page say? So, so we go through this, and we get to the end, and I find myself thinking, like, is this really effective like, is he really, like, taking any of this in? Is he at all, like, connecting the dots? He seems really into it, sure. And then we come to the point where you ask him, like, hey, like, do you want to pray to receive Christ? He's like, nah, I don't want to do any of that. And then he just walks away. And so I walk away, too, and I, and I find myself thinking, like, you know, is this, not, not just that one interaction, but, like, this whole thing of sharing our faith, effective. Like, does, like, does it really impact people? Now, in the evenings of the sessions, like, they had this moment where we would hear testimonies and stories from students who were out sharing the gospel with people, and there would be these great stories of amazing things that God had done throughout the day, and some of them were just mind-blowing. And so, even though I had a moment of doubt, like, is this effective? I'd go, and I'd sit, and I'd listen, and I'd be like, no, it is, because God is present, and He's at work. But that led me to wrestle through another question. And that question was, am I effective? But maybe this is effective, right? Sharing the gospel and even walking up to random strangers. Maybe God can work through that. But am I effective? Like, do I really know what I'm doing? And I wonder if anybody has ever had that same thought. I wonder if anybody here this morning has ever wondered, like, am I actually effective for the kingdom? Am, am I actually effective in sharing my faith? Do I actually even know what I'm doing? I wonder if you've ever been in a spiritual conversation, tried to share your faith, tried to share the gospel, and wrestled through that question. And with the world that we live in today, with people so easily being triggered, people so quick to get angry and start a fight, you have a few discouraging interactions with friends or with family members, and it's easy to wonder, like, 
Like, is it worth it? Is it actually worth putting myself out there, taking a little bit of a risk, and sharing the gospel? Now, the assumption of the New Testament is that as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to be people who share our faith, right? It says in Acts 1 that we are called to be witnesses. We are called to tell the world what we have seen, what we have experienced, how we've engaged with God, and how in the same way that we have experienced life change, they can as well. But I wonder if one of the reasons why we we don't do that, or we're hesitant, or a little shy to do that, is because it's easy to question whether or not sharing the gospel is effective, and to question whether or not I, in the process, am effective. Well, our passage today highlights a conversation that Jesus had with a woman. And when we look at this conversation through a certain vantage point, we learn something about Jesus' approach to sharing the good news with this woman that can help us be effective in our own attempts. And this is how the passage begins. This is John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And we read, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So as we cross into chapter 4, Jesus is on the move. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, if we look here on this map, Jesus was down south in the southern region of Israel, in an area called Galilee, hanging out in Jerusalem. And we're told, now that we cross into chapter 4, he's going to be on the move going back north to Galilee. That's essentially where he's from. His hometown is up that way. And so basically, he is on his way home, leaving this mission trip that he had just been on down south in the southern region. And we read this in verse 4. Now, he had to go through Samaria which might be obvious, right? Because to go from the south to the north, like Samaria was right in between, and so he had to go through, but we'll come back to that in a minute. We read in verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. If you're somebody who circles and writes in your Bibles, do that, noon. We'll come back to that as well. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now, the first thing we see about Jesus' strategy when it comes to reaching out to people is that Jesus is on mission right where he is. Right? Essentially, in this moment, Jesus is on his way home from the mission trip. Like the trip was to go to the south, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to teach, to baptize, to perform signs and wonders, to do things there, and now he is on his way home. So essentially, the trip is over, but the mission continues. And I think this story can be a challenge for us, because if you're anything like me, it's easy to compartmentalize your life. We have all these different boxes and buckets of our life. We have our family life that's over here. We have our work life that sits right here. We have our leisure life, and then we have our spiritual life. And sometimes we keep all of these compartments distant from each other, and they never really integrate. But the call of our faith is to live one life. Not to live four different lives, but to live one life and have all of the areas of our life integrated, specifically our spiritual life, and to see our life and to see our world as being fully encompassed by our spiritual life so that it actually informs every other part of our life. But it's easy to compartmentalize them and to separate them And I think sometimes when we think of the idea of missions, we think that missions happens over there. Missions happens somewhere else. Outreach happens when I go do this one activity, when in reality, the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ is supposed to encompass all of our life. I I saw this firsthand when I was a youth pastor. We were living in Atlanta at the time, and the first couple years we were there, we would take a group of students from Atlanta all the way to the West Coast. We'd land in LA, we'd fly there, and then we'd drive down, we'd cross the border in Mexico and go to a, a camp there that was put on Azusa, by Azusa Pacific University. 
And it kind of had that same format from the, the trip I went to when I was in college in that there was a worship service in the morning, a worship service in the evening. Throughout the day, we would go into the area of Tijuana and we would serve alongside different churches and just partner with them in doing whatever they needed done. Sometimes it was work on the building. Sometimes it was VBS stuff for kids. And we would go back each year and it was a, it was a trip that our students looked forward to every year. And there was all this buildup. It was, it was a lot of work because we had to, like, we camped. So we had to like bring all of our camping gear. We brought like 40 students. We had all these leaders. It was a high expense. It was a big deal. We had to rent vans. It was all kinds of things. But I started to wonder when we got home from the trip, like, is this actually making an impact in our students' lives for how they view the world? They loved the trip. They had a great time. But it seemed as though when we got home, they would say like, oh yeah, like that thing over there. They would talk about mission in terms of what we did in Mexico, but were never able to translate the idea that this actually is something we do everywhere. So there was one year, we actually made a very controversial move and we canceled that trip. And instead of doing a Mexico trip, we did what we called a missions week. And every day, we would go to a different part of the city, hoping to give our kids a vision for what it means to reach out to the place where you live and work and go to school every day. And so for us at Meadowbrook Church, that's the hope, that, that we would see Wauwatosa, West Dallas, Menominee Falls, the city of Milwaukee, Brookfield, Elm Grove as our mission field, and that we are sent to these places. The call of Acts 1 is that we are to go to the ends of the earth, Jesus says, but not at the neglect of where we are. Because when Acts 1 happens, the church is in Jerusalem, and Jesus says, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, but the call is to start right where you are. And so what are those areas in your life where you could bring gospel intentionality? Where are those spaces in your life where you could start to view your world as a mission field and think about how you could reach out to people in those spaces wherever you are? The first thing we see about Jesus reaching out is he's on mission right where he is. The next thing we see is that Jesus is okay with crossing boundaries. And he will cross three boundaries in this interaction. The first one is a cultural boundary. Because where is Jesus in this moment? We've already told, been told he's in Samaria. And Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. They were enemies. There, were, they, there was disdain for each other. There's this place in Luke 9 where Jesus is trying to go through Samaria again on another time. And he's, he's not being well received. And two of the disciples say, Jesus, how about we call down fire from heaven and blow these guys up? That'll teach him a lesson. Don't you think they'll get the message if we just light them up with fire from heaven? Like even Jesus' own disciples were quick to just obliterate the Samaritans without even a care, right? They did not get along at all. But the fact that Jesus is even in Samaria is surprising, right? Because if we go back to the map, we said that Jesus is on the move from the south to the north, and he would have to go through Samaria, but it wasn't uncommon for Jews who were traveling north to south or south to north not to go through Samaria, but to go around Samaria and avoid it altogether. But Jesus says, no, no, no. we're going to go through Samaria and go right into enemy territory. So Jesus is crossing cultural boundaries. The second is that Jesus is crossing social boundaries. Now, because of the power dynamic between men and women in the first century world, it was very unusual for men to publicly talk to women, especially when they were alone. And so here, this woman and Jesus are by the well, and it would be kind of unusual for Jesus just to engage with her. Not just because she's a woman, but also because she's an outcast. It says that she's drawing water at noon, which would have been unusual for women in the ancient world to go draw water at noon because it's the hottest part of the day. Usually they would go in a group and they would go early in the morning or late in the evening when the sun wasn't so high. And so the fact that this woman is there by herself means she probably doesn't want to be around the other women who hang out at the well because there's something about her reputation that they know of, or they treat her unfairly, or in some way she's just cast aside. And so Jesus is crossing a cultural barrier. 
He's crossing a social barrier. And this woman even recognizes that Jesus is doing this. She says this in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. When the disciples return in verse 27, they even think it's weird that Jesus is having this conversation with this woman. So he's crossing cultural boundaries, social boundaries, and then he's even crossing religious boundaries because as the conversation continues, it becomes clear that there are religious differences between these two that kind of keep these groups of people at bay. And so one reason we might be ineffective in sharing our faith is because we're prone to stay in our comfort zones. We're prone to gravitate towards things that make us feel safe and comfortable and at ease. Church people are some of the worst at it. I mean, we create our own bubble, our own subculture. We have our own music. We have our own media. We have our own vacation spots. Everything that we can do to keep us safe because the world is bad. And if we come in contact with them, they might infect us. So also when we lived in Atlanta, uh, we lived on this block that had a mosque on the block. It was not like this like temple-looking building. It was a couple of houses that this group of people had bought and converted into a little mosque, and I would walk by it every day. And one day, the imam, which would be like the, the comparison of a pastor in the mosque, he's out just walking the streets, and he just says hi to me. He's just trying to be friendly. He doesn't know what I do, and so we get into a conversation and he's, I, I tell him somewhere along the way that I'm a pastor, and he's like, oh, it would be so great to have you come and sit and talk. And so later that week, um, I went to go visit with him. And, and I was, remember telling somebody in my church about this, thinking like, I got invited by this imam to go to a mosque. I'm trying to process what I should do. And this guy goes, oh, I would not go there. And I was like, really, why? He's like, oh, he was just convinced that all Muslims were evil, that they were all filled with demons, and that somehow I was going to get infected and that I was going to be walking into this dark world. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, there might be darkness there, but do you know what I bring with me? Bring the light of Christ. And what does John say in chapter 1? The light shines where? In the darkness. And what does the darkness not do? It does not overcome the light. The light always wins. And so I remember, I went to the mosque. We had this fantastic conversation. He invited me back another day. And if you know anything about Muslims, they're, they're really ritualistic with their prayer. They have this very consistent prayer regimen where they pray so many times a day. And the next time I went to visit, I was like in the middle of their prayer time. And we're standing in the back or whatever. And all of these men file in because men have one house. The women have another house. They keep themselves separated. All these men file in. He brings me up front and we sit down and he starts to introduce me to the group. And he's like, hey, speak to them. Share with them. Like, and I was like so caught off guard. And all I was able to do, and I had like a minute, tell them that I, I love them and that God loves them and that we are here for them. See, when we go into uncomfortable spaces, we might be surprised we might be surprised at what comes our way, what God does, the open doors that he gives to us, and we have the ability to partner with him in reaching other people who might otherwise be far from God. And so if we're going to be effective in reaching people, we have to be willing to go to them, not expect or anticipate that they will come to us. So Jesus is on mission right where he is. He's comfortable and okay with crossing boundaries. And then next, he puts himself in a place of need. We're told in verse 6 that he's tired from his journey. This is part of Jesus' humanity coming out. And when this woman shows up, he asks for a drink. He's basically asking for help. Now what's interesting about Jesus he doesn't really need help, does he? Like we saw in chapter 2, he has the ability to turn water into wine, 
right? Some of the best wine that anybody has ever tasted. We're going to see in chapter 6 that he has the ability to multiply bread and fish somehow miraculously. Basically, he turns something from nothing. He probably doesn't need help getting water. He probably can figure it out on his own, but he's intentionally shifting the power dynamic here. He's limiting himself. That's all, what, all of what Jesus does when he comes to earth in the form of a human. He's limiting himself, and he's asking for help. Anybody here not like asking for help? Anybody here not want to admit, I can't do this? I can't figure this out? And if I go to this person and I ask for help, I'm admitting I'm weak. I'm admitting I don't know. Sometimes, we, not only do we not like asking people for help, like if we're out to lunch or out to coffee and somebody offers to pay, we're like, no, 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 I, I, let me pay. Or no, 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 l- let me take care of myself. Because there's something in us about not wanting to be in somebody else's debt, whether it's for a cup of coffee or help, because we want to continue this perception of being strong and able. But Jesus limits himself here. He lowers himself. He shifts the power dynamic, knowing that he's going to be on equal playing field with this woman. And then in some ways, it's also a test. Because if someone is willing to help, it also shows the softness of their heart. And that's exactly where Jesus goes next. Not only is he on mission right where he is, not only is he okay with crossing boundaries, not only does he put himself in need, but he goes for the desires of our heart. This is how the conversation continues. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring in them and it will well up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, at this point in the conversation, Jesus and the woman are talking about two very different things. And Jesus knows this. The woman thinks they're talking about literal, physical water, where Jesus is talking about spirituality and eternal things. They are talking on two different planes. She doesn't know it, but Jesus does. And so to try and help her see what he's doing, he shifts the conversation pretty abruptly, pretty quickly to a very different place. He says to her in verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. Now this must have been a really strange and unsettling question for her. She's probably thinking to herself in this moment, who is this guy? What does he know about me? And how does he know it? And Jesus says to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, over the years of church history, many things have been assumed of this woman that are not in the text. It's been assumed that the reason she has five husbands is because she's been unfaithful. She's been a lady of the night and has just used men for her own self-gratification. None of that is in the text. I've sat with people in conversation where we've talked about what it means to reach out to others and share our faith. And people have talked about this passage as though Jesus is very confrontational. Jesus is in people's face and he even calls this woman a harlot. He never does. Jesus is kind. He's gentle. He's tender. Is he confrontational? Yes. But the people he's most forceful with in confrontation are not people whose lives are filled with brokenness and pain, but those who are overcome with pride and religiosity. 
So we don't know exactly why this woman has had five husbands. Maybe each one has died. In the ancient world, life expectancy was much shorter. It was much more fragile than it is now. And it could be that when one husband dies, there's this provision in the Old Testament that that husband's brother can take you into his family. We don't know the details, but the fact that Jesus names this reality in her life and names that she's with a guy right now who's not even her husband indicates that this is probably an area of her life that is both filled with pain and brokenness and distress and simultaneously filled with longing and desire. She has this thought that if I can just have a man in my life, everything will be okay. Meaning she has repeatedly attempted to find fulfillment in her life in relationships with men, and it's not working. Because I either keep leaving, or they keep dying, or she leaves, and it's not bringing her satisfaction at all. And this search for the thing that will bring meaning and fulfilling and fulfillment and longing in our life is not unique to her. It's true of the human story everywhere. Uh, John Mayer put out in his second album uh, titled Heavier Things a song titled Something's Missing. And I think this song captures the desire of humanity everywhere. The, the song starts with the court verse saying, I'm not alone, but I wish I was, because then I'd know I was down because I couldn't find a friend around to love me like they do right now. Basically, John Mayer is saying, like, I'm on top of the world. Like, I have everything. I have more people in my life than I know what to do with. I'm famous. I'm on TV. I'm all over the radio. I'm touring the world. I've made it. I'm huge. But I am so alone and not fulfilled. He goes on to say the second verse, I'm dizzy from the shopping malls. I searched for joy, but bought it all. And it doesn't help the hunger pains or the thirst that I'd have to drown first to ever satiate. Like, I'm trying to find that thing will that will fulfill me, and I have all the means to go buy it, and I am buying it, but each time I buy it, it just leaves me more empty inside. And the chorus goes, something's missing, and I don't know how to fix it. Something's missing, and I don't know what it is. No, I don't know what it is. The bridge to this song is fascinating to me because it's like a checklist. He lists off all these things that he has in life. He goes, friends? Check. I've got friends. Money? Check. Well slept? Like I'm comfortable. I get a good night's sleep? Check. Opposite sex? Check. Guitar? Check. Microphone? Check. My career is just thriving. Messages waiting for me when I come home. I've got all these people reaching out to me. Check. 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 My life is everything that I thought it would be. Everything that I could have ever hoped it would be. Everything I dreamed it would be, I have everything. I have the world at my fingertips, yet something's missing, and I don't know what it is. One author said, the loneliest moment in a person's life is when they experience what they thought would bring them ultimate joy and satisfaction, and it leaves them feeling empty and only wanting more. We all have this thing that we think will bring us long, or that we think will fulfill all our longings. The question is, what is that for you? Are you pursuing it? Have you acquired it? And is it actually bringing fulfillment? After Jesus reveals that he knows about her desires and her relationship with men, this is her response, verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, many people think like she's trying to divert attention to this painful place of her life, that she's trying to deflect what Jesus has just revealed about her. He's just put his finger on the most difficult spot, and she's like, let's talk about this over here. But I also wonder if this is maybe a moment where she is starting to be drawn in because she knows there's something with this guy. And maybe she actually has a legitimate question. 
mean, it's very similar to what happens in chapter 1 with Nathaniel. Jesus says, I, I saw you while you were under that tree before you ever met me. And he's like, oh, who is this guy? There might be something to him. Maybe she has the same response. And she's asking a legitimate question. And this is Jesus' response, verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come When the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Now, there is so much theology, like, packed into those fruit verses. But at the same time, it almost seems like a setup. Because he probably knows if I dump this on her, it might just go right over her head. And that seems to be what happens, because she says in verse 25, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain all of it to us. Like, it's all confusing, I get it, but there's a guy who's coming who will sort it all out, and Jesus knows. At this moment, he has her. He has her right where he wants her because he says to her next in verse 26, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. Not only the one who's going to answer your questions and help sort out this religious debate, but I'm the one who's here because I will satisfy all your longings. All the men you've gone to pale in comparison to me. They can't offer you what I offer you, and I am here to give you the thing your heart longs for. Jesus is essentially trying to tell this woman and all of us that Jesus fills the unfulfilled longings of our heart. Jesus fills the unfulfilled longings of our heart. It says in Psalm 103 that the Lord seeks to satisfy our desires with good things. He has good things for you. And his hope and his joy is that you will experience them in spades, and he wants to give them to you, but it means we have to reckon with our desires and see if they are selfish and self-motivated or if they're in a place where like, God, I trust you. I I trust you to be the one that ultimately fulfills the longings of my heart. And so it, it brings us back to the question, what does it mean to be effective? What does it mean to be effective in our faith and how we share it with others? I think sometimes... We're tempted to like prove other people wrong, prove that we're right, ram scriptures down their throats so that they know how well learned we are and how well versed in the Bible we are. But I wonder if in our day and age, the most effective strategy is simply to get people to wrestle with and reckon with two questions. Two questions. One, the Jesus question. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want in life? And then there's the Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you? Is the thing that you want, the thing that you think will satisfy the longing of your heart, is it doing that? Or is it just leaving you wanting more? And in that place, how are you feeling about yourself? Are you feeling fulfilled? Do you have joy running over? Or do you find, like John Mayer, something is still missing? Jesus comes to fulfill the unfilled longings of our heart. To show you that he is far better than we could ever imagine or dream. And as you experience that, as you taste and see that the Lord is good, it changes the way you speak about him to others. Because no longer are you trying to prove anything to anybody. It's like, hey, hey, and this woman will do this as the chapter goes on. Come meet this man who has changed my life and told me everything I ever did and exposed all my pain and brokenness, but loves me like nobody has ever done before. When you experience that, it changes the way you understand who Jesus is, and who you are in light of who he is. And it changes the way you share the good news with others.
So may you see and know that Jesus satisfies the desires of your heart. May it compel you to be on mission right where you are. And may you be willing to move outside your comfort zone to share the love of Jesus with those who live around you day by day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love, for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for the ways that you, even in our pain, our brokenness, and our shame, you meet us. You speak to us. You're kind and compassionate. You're understanding. And so, Lord, may we open our hearts to you to receive the love that you offer, to trust that you do, in fact, satisfy our desires with good things. And may we go out into the world carrying that good news to bring hope to those who are in desperate need. Amen.